employers need highly qualified and diverse talent to grow. Unmuddle is a marketplace to help you with workforce and upskill needs. To learn more, go to unmuddle.com slash employers. That's U-N-M-U-D-L dot com slash employers. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio, back with you again on another episode. We're up to like 300 and 400 something. I don't know how many we've done, but a bunch of them. Interviewing people all across the land of higher education, business, and industry. It's been amazing. We just passed, uh, as you guys know, if you've been listening, we passed 100,000 downloads of this podcast it's right at the end of of, of 2021. Elvin and I had a bet of whether we could get to 100,000. We actually ended at 106,000. I turned out to be right yet again, Elvin, and you wrong as usual, uh, but we'll talk about that later. And then, of course, you guys know, uh, Kate uh, Colbert and I have our book. Uh, pre, uh, we have a book coming out called Commencement, uh, A New Era in Higher Education, as seen through the eyes of 100 plus college and university presidents that we are currently writing. We had a big cover reveal um, that you'll see that by the time this episode airs, that will have happened. Appreciate your support um, on, on that book. Of course, there's a lot of insights from all these presidents uh, and ed tech folks that we've interviewed. Um, as I always say, I love when uh, episodes of first come together. I've got a first time a guest co-host and a first time guest. So um, it's always fun to see what a train wreck uh, it is when we have a bunch of firsts, <laughs> but it's also fun at the same time. And that's the way we like to keep it here. So I'm gonna bring, um, first bring in my uh, guest co-host. Um, you know him, you do know him. If you don't know him, you need to know him. Uh, here he comes, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, here we go. He's the executive director of the Charles Koch Foundation, Ryan Stowers, what's happening, Ryan? Thanks, Joe. I'm, I'm just happy to be here. Really honored to be here once again. Are you excited to be with me or are you just fearful now that I'm going to just totally screw it up for you? I, I got to be just... honest. I'm I'm mostly excited about our other guests. No offense, but. <laughs> well, I guess none taken. Ryan is my first time guest co-host and, and already given me the business. I appreciate that because I like <laughs> I like uh, these episodes to remain nice and and fun. And we've got a fun guest. And I'm well. Let's just bring her in, Ryan. No more. No more about me or you, right? Here she comes. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Pazzo. <laughs> she she got the she's laughing already. She's managing partner at GSV Ventures, and she's also co co-founder at ASU GSV Summit. Deb, what's happening? How are you? I'm awesome. I'm awesome. I have a lot to live up to now, so I'm going to have to work it. Well, you know what? Only here at the Edip Experience can you get like a uh, applause at any time of the day at any moment. <laughs> there That's it is good. Again, Deb. What an honor to have you with us. Um, you know, we've got a, a pretty broad audience here of higher ed professionals all across the land. People, as I said, business and industry, ed tech. I want you to just lay the foundation for us. What is GSV Ventures for those that don't know? And what is ASU GSV for those that don't know? Although they've probably been living under a rock if they don't know. <laughs> I appreciate that too. Yeah, well, it's, you know, for, um, I guess the last 25 years, remarkably, um, certainly way before it was sexy, I have been, uh, I've been involved with the education technology and education innovation space and have worn a lot of hats in that regard, investment banker, and convener and, and uh, writer and, whatever thought leader, I guess. And, and I have a partner in, um, in Silicon Valley, Michael Moe, who's been sort of the, the thought leader partner. And um, yeah, so we've been sort of, we've been talking about the ed, ed tech and education innovation, innovation space for a long time. Um, obviously not everyone's talking about it, but um, we, in 2016, we, we launched GSV Ventures and that, and GSV stands for Global Silicon Valley, by the way, it was, you know, the concept that um, Silicon Valley is, is, uh, is, is a physical place, but it's really a state of mind and that innovation can happen everywhere. And certainly it is today. Um, so we, in 2016, launched our first uh, venture capital fund, GSV Ventures. We're, we're, um, we're now on our raising our third fund, but uh, we are solely focused on, on investing in the pre-K to gray, as we call it, um, education space. So across early childhood, K-12, higher education workforce. Um, and we, we invest globally. So we've been um, you know, fortunate to be an investor we were in Coursera, we were in Masterclass, we were in Turn It In, we've been in, uh, we have an incredible investment company called Lead School in India in the K-12 market, we have Guild Education here in the U.S., 
um, in the higher ed space. So we've got a, a broad and diverse portfolio. And, um, and uh, so that's that, that's that piece of the puzzle. Um, that piece actually came, was, was, uh, was really, really, um, in fact, and that spun out the wrong term, but um, inspired by the ASU GSB Summit. Um, 13 years ago, we partnered with Arizona State University, as, as we like to say at a time when it was not completely obvious that ASU um, would have been the right partner uh, for education innovation, education technology innovation, um, and, and, all, and all the other things they have now become famous for, you know, academic excellence, et cetera. Um, so we're very fortunate that we were able to partner um, with ASU at a time where they were um, perhaps under-recognized for the, for the things that were going on under the hood. Um, and uh, we have built over the last 13 years um, what we think is a, a, a fantastic convening um, of folks across the pre-K to gray um, education, ed tech and education innovation um, sector. And, uh, every, and, and we always, what we love about it is that we like to call it a strange cocktail um, because it, it, it's everything from leading, leading philanthropists and foundations like the Koch Foundation, who is a wonderful partner of ours, um, to uh, education practitioners from K-12 and higher ed and, and early childhood and workforce to, um, to investors and uh, you know, four or 500 ed tech founders from all over the world, et cetera. So it's a, a great mashup of people who really want to change the world for good, as we like to, as we like to call it. And our overarching mantra really is that um, all people deserve equal access to the future. Uh, and we believe that from our, you know, from our vantage point, um, access to high quality education, equitable access to high quality education, is a really um, an, uh, critical lever in achieving kind of that that um, that mantra. So that's that's a mouthful, but um, that's uh, that, that's that's my the best I can do on an elevator pitch. Wow, wow, I like it. Um, let me ask you this, but Ryan, before I bring you in, pre K to gray. Is that a yep. gray meaning jobs or meaning the state of higher education, as it, as it were? Uh, no, gray gray means uh, it's actually referring to age. So, um, oh, okay. so we look at yeah everything from early childhood all the way up through um, through uh, gray adults, um, which that's, that's, which is where I'm heading. So no, that's interesting, yeah. and I like that because it implies lifelong learning too. It implies exactly right. educational yeah, exactly. technology. Uh, uh, a higher education going um, going until you know for your hundred years instead of your four years uh, if we if we exactly were lucky to live that long, uh, educational technology um, has seen an explosion uh, in companies yep. in it in the last what couple of years in particular and coronavirus certainly was a, a one of the catalysts that uh, yep. I think uh, produced that uh, renaissance. I, is it just crazy? right now as it seems i mean you do see these stats about i don't know how many billions of dollars are going to educational technology is it just literally left and right companies coming from everywhere right now yeah it's pretty interesting yeah it was about 20 billion dollars went into the category um in 2021 um and that's up from I mean, you know in the old days when we hit five billion of investment it was a you know everybody jumped up and down screaming yelp um I think it's representative of the fact that we have we have so many strong um, entrepreneurs coming into the category with strong ideas, and so many ideas have been opportunities really have been opened up um, by. It, we are heading in that direction with the pandemic, but the pandemic has obviously caused a lot of habit change, um, and has forced a lot of people to consider digital alternatives. If um, even if they had previously not been terribly um, inclined to do so. And so, and while it hasn't been a smooth experience for, for everybody, certainly, and we can all read the, the horror stories, particularly in the, K, in the K-12 market, but, um, but I, it, for, for the most part, it has been a pretty dramatic um, sea, sea change in, in habit and attitude and embrace of, of alternatives that can be um, digitally delivered. And of course, um, we need that because we have such massive you know, academic gaps and skills gaps um, through, throughout the pre K to gray chain that um, that that those those gaps will never be able to be um, eliminated w without the you know without the benefit of scale and it's and it's very difficult to scale without without the um, the underpinning of a of a of a technology complement so yeah it's crazy I mean it's it's um it's very active really fundamentally fantastic companies being built um, we're you know all over the world actually we're seeing you know education as an export is a big big has been a big theme for us. Um, company, companies all over the way from India or companies in the U.S., you know, 
education used to be extremely parochial. You, it, that was true of the higher ed market too. You guys well know um, the parochial uh, you know, nature. The parochial element has has pretty much totally gone, and 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 we're just you know we're seeing you know, great great innovation happening all over the world, and then being transported from wherever that point is to other points all over the world. So that's pretty cool too. Yeah, I can back that up. I was in Doha for the uh, Qatar Foundation's um, a, a Wise Conference World Innovation Summit for Education. Yep. There were a lot of technology companies there from, I don't know, all over the world trying to, to get a start and get into to global education. And Ryan, I know uh, the work that you guys are doing at the Koch Foundation, you're all over the front end uh, of this stuff too. So let me pass the mic to you. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Joe and Deb. This, is, this has been fascinating. And you you mentioned we just we're so thrilled to be partnered with you and we learn so much every time that we we connect with you i've got i've got a lot right. of questions i could ask but i've got one that i've been dying to ask and it it um it kind of came out of of some of what you said but you've been you've invested in some of the most trans, transformational leaders in ed in a couple of decades and you know just to name a few like guild you you named some of them masterclass coursera what is your secret? Like, how are you, what's unique about your approach that's allowed you to identify these, these winners, these, these people that are having a huge impact on the space? Uh, well, thank you for that. And we, um, right back at you at the, um, we, we, we always learn a ton when we, when we talk to the Coke team, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a extraordinary, um, work that you guys are doing from, from, uh, prison reform to, to everything else on, on down the on down the line so thank uh, thank you guys the um you know it's interesting one one i i mean i just start with I, we we the fact that we've been working in ed in education for 25 years i think does give us a unique pattern recognition um i think it is it, it can be really helpful i think people i think have historically underestimated some of the frictions you can run into in education in within the education systems um I, you know, it, it's, it's, and, and how that can impact um, startup companies. Um, and I think that we've been pretty good at, at um, with our pattern recognition in, in really assessing where companies would have bigger risks than perhaps others might have thought they would. Um, we're not perfect, you know, goodness. And, it, and, I, and we're, we're, we've made lots of mistakes and we'll continue to make lots of mistakes, but I do think pattern recognition is really helpful. Other than that, we actually, you know, we step back, we have a framework, um, we call the we have two frameworks really one we call the five p's which is people product potential predictability and purpose um you know people being number one you know the 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 inevitably the success of an organization is going to be driven by the people the, the founder the leaders founders the leaders um the folks that, that those founders and leaders bring around them um inevitably when we've made a mistake it's been it's been the leadership related um you know, then we look at the product. Is it special, different, or great? Is it is it addressing a white space? Is it you know is it Coursera? Does it have sort of this multi leg, um, multi legs on the stool for for the business model? Um, what's the potential? What's the total addressable market? I think one of the things that's happened, most importantly in ed in, in ed tech, is um, the the total addressable market TAM explosion that's occurred, and it's it's really exploded in two different ways. One is that ed tech as an export that I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, companies now being able to sell their, their products into global markets, which is a big sea change, um, has dramatically expanded you know, opportunities there. Um, and then secondarily, we're seeing companies um, go extend the lifetime value of learners um, along the pre-K to grade spectrum. So you've seen companies like Baiju out of India or um, Eriditis out of India or um, um, You'll you'll begin you'll you'll begin to see the Courseras in the world actually in the not-for-profit side of ASU is pushed into the K-12 online higher high school market and into the corporate market. So you're seeing educational organizations um, extend their reach um, from pre-K up to gray and, and increasing um, lifetime value. So that's that has a big um, high, you know positive impact on potential for a company um, and then uh, and predictability around business model and milestones. And then we do believe we've always believed that purpose purpose driven companies are are um, are more successful, and um, and so we're we're always looking for that um, piece of purpose. And then finally, we have this concept we call return on education or ROE. And um, for us, we're an impact fund, and um, so a company 
needs to be, an organization needs to be driving high ROE, and that means reducing costs. It doesn't have to hit, I mean, ideally they hit all, but the most d don't, but at least hit some or all of these. Uh, increase access, lower cost, um, improving learning and skilling efficacy, uh, and providing uh, leverage to the learning leader. And the learning leader could be a, a K-12 teacher or a faculty member in higher ed, it could it could be yourself, because um, there's obviously a lot of self-agency in learning today, um, or it could be an enterprise a corporate um, learning learning provider. So that's kind of the framework we've used. We've been using the framework for 20 plus years, um, so have consistently applied it. And and I'd love to think that that is kind of what's led us, Ryan, to to um, some pretty um, some pretty good alignment with some of the best companies um, in the space. Before you ask another one, Ryan, um, in, in fact, it, it could just be, that was an amazing question, amazing answer, but let me ask it just a little bit of a different way. Uh, and I'm asking for a friend. If my friend had a couple thousand dollars to throw around, which company should he invest in? Uh, is I think the better way that Ryan was many, meaning to ask that question because there's so much and I ask it because there's so much noise out there that there are so many technology companies and I'm asking it to be funny but there's so many technology <laughs> companies how you vet through them is just now yeah. is, is it, yeah. it's remarkable right yeah no it's it's uh, we saw well, I'm trying to think in the last 12 months um, our team met over 1900 met on zoom of course for the most part um over 1900 companies so pretty extraordinary it's insane ryan go ahead sorry to interrupt you no you're good joe i, I just following up on that i mean do you see just in in the the groups that you're looking at and the big shift toward uh technology i mean do you see a risk in viewing technology as the silver bullet when you think about innovation, are there yeah. other fronts where innovation needs to occur? And how, how would you unpack that? What do you think the risks are there? Yeah, I think and I, I think that's a it's a great question, right? And, and I and what I would say, I mean, the good news in the evolution of this space is that and and you know what we think education technology will become an, a trillion dollar tech category sometime in the 27, 28 time frame. Whereas previously we thought it was probably more in the in the mid 2030s, so there has been you know just this great expansion of of activity. I think one of the really I think great if you if you go back to the kind of the beginning you know, the 99 2000 period, there was a real um, uh, there was a real there was a lot of friction actually around this question. There was a, there was a real knee jerk reaction by by many. Um, one, because we weren't, you know, we weren't a country, you know, we weren't a world of digital natives yet, but, but a, a concern that these ideas um, were, were out to replace human, you know, the human element of teaching and learning. Um, and I think people quickly realized, I mean, quickly realized the most successful businesses, and that's why one of our ROE points is, is providing leverage to the learning leader, learning or skilling leader, um, because it, 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 it's actually about scaling you know, the, for us, it's about you know making making the lives of teachers easier, making the lives of faculty easier, making you know pro, enabling um, tutors to provide provide their services at scale. So I think it's it's moved from a, a concern that this is all about you know eliminating the people element of educational delivery to um, actually enabling the human element to reach people at scale, you know, students learners at scale. Um, and to do it in increasingly engaging and and high return ways as as we get better and better at at you know whether it's peer to peer or uh, master class like you know video delivery or um, things like that. So so I think the I don't I mean I guess um, if anyone thinks that technology can be the silver bullet, um, I, you know I think they they will they will you know always be wrong on that bet. Um, it's got to be an enabler uh, for great teachers and learners, and and um, in a broad in the broad sense of the definition, to to actually um, have higher impact on 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 more uh, on more people. So yeah, I think it's I, I think we're I mean there's still some folks out there, and there there've been a bunch. I mean who who think you can put a lot of you know a lot of measuring equipment into into or a lot of technology into into desks and measure everything that kids are doing and things like that and that'll get there and i you know so far we haven't seen a lot of success in those kinds of solutions and you know 
a lot of, a lot of work around AI tutors and things like that. And, and, and I do hope actually we get to a place where those can, you know, those types of solutions can be very effective because again, I think they actually love, they provide leverage to leverage to, to, um, to teachers, um, you know, and students. Uh, so it's, it, I think we're actually, I'm in a, you know, I'm in a pretty positive mode on that, um, in that kind of thinking. Um, actually, you know, at this moment, but we'll see. Because obviously there's a lot of new and emerging technologies still to come. Um, you know, we're just hitting the front edge of AI and NLP and machine learning and everything producing effective products in education. So um, it'll be interesting to see. One of the things that you said that I, that I love, um, and I want to ask you uh, about, I mean, it's just the vetting process again as we, it, as we stick on it, is so much about technology is to enhance relationship, you, you would hope, especially in education, right? There's relationships we have, so student to teacher, administrator to, to, to teacher, uh, students, people. Technology should enhance those relationships and that learning. That, that that's that's the great part about it. When we try to replace those relationships with technology, sometimes that that's where it can't be a silver bullet. How much of what you do when you're looking at investments and you're looking at companies, how much of the research is about the student or the end user, how they're evolving, how they're evolving using technology or accessing technology or data or, you know what I mean? Cause yeah. The, Cause the student yeah. evolves fast yeah. or faster than the technology. Absolutely. And it's so funny. We just had this conversation. I just had this conversation with my partner, Michael Mother today. Um, so we're spending a lot of time on what's going on with web three and the, and you know, metaverse, which we're calling Everse, And, um, and what impacts that could have on learning um, and, and educational delivery. And, and, and it's pretty interesting because it, it's like, I mean, truth be told, I, I'm not going to want to learn as an avatar. That's not me. But, but I'm not the generation that, um, that I'm, not, I'm not the generation this, 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 this work is focused on or resonating with. And I'm not the generation that grew up with, you know, gaming and, and, and all the things, you know, that kind of thing that, that, that kind of um, ecosystem that's going to make you what's what's happening around metaverse et cetera really resonate and so um i, I think it's you're, you're dead on it, it, it students are changing rapidly um so you know so far that change students and teachers are changing rapidly I and mean, just the the simple decade move from teachers being analog to teachers being digital has made a huge you know difference in the adoption of educational technologies in k-12 and higher ed and um and so we have to all keep our eye on the student. Um, and by the way, we also need to keep our eye on the, I mean, the gray part of the spectrum too, right? Because there's, we're living longer. Um, there are more, you know, active adults in the other. So, it, and those are very, you know, those are very different learners, um, you know, in the, in the, um, in the gray part of the spectrum and the, right. and the, uh, and the K-12 and higher ed part of the spectrum. So it's, so it's a, it's really, really important um, I, it is completely obvious to us now that it, that that these new environments, the, the metaverses that are being built, um, that are are going to be comfortable places for students uh, to learn, to to have peer to peer collaboration, to do project based learning, to have you know very active learning engagement, and I and I think um, you know in a lot of the paradigms that we have you know that we all grew up with, and I speak for myself, but. Um, are just are, are are static and not engaging and boring to to these gener to their to the younger generation. So they have to be you know the game has to be changed. And so we're we're totally and we you know we have part of our team really dedicated to everything you know looking at everything around um, uh, you know learn l learn to earn and all these sort of uh, web three and um, and, uh, and metaverse um developments that are that are really engaging a whole new level um a, and, and you know that's the you know that's the important thing that needs to happen because i think students you know in in um if you can't get if you can't get students engaged they're not going to learn they're not going to remember there's not going to be retention it's just not going to be effective so i think student engagement is something we have to all be focused on and particularly as we look at the numbers coming out of COVID of the, of the people who have um, you know, who have dropped out or, um, you know, the, the student losses are stunning. So, so I think that we need to all think about 
um, what what do, what do these new deliveries mean, and and how can we? Um, and we're certainly thinking hard about how we can invest in them. The vision of Unmuddle for the future is that the high cost, rigidity, and uncertain reward of pursuing higher education would be replaced with an economical, transparent, infinitely adjustable sequence of lifelong learning stints in which the employer, college, and learner are in constant communication about current needs and the system can respond quickly to each. Employers need highly qualified and diverse talent to grow. Unmodel is a marketplace that will help you with workforce and upskilling needs. To learn more, go to unmodel.com slash employers. Hey, um, just, just jumping in. I love this conversation about learner voice and student engagement. And Deb, I love the way that you unpacked. It's such a huge difference when you think about, you know, the, the avatar versus the, the person that's been in a job for 30 years. And one of the things that's most attractive about your vision is this idea, I think I pulled this from your web, website, but giving all people equal access to, to learning. Are you, yep. seeing, are you seeing strategies from an impact investment standpoint? Are you seeing strategies that are, that are effectively going to reach the people that, that never viewed themselves as worthy or, or, or never even have the self-esteem to assume that they were the right fit for post-secondary learning? Are, yes, there, are yes. there innovations occurring that can reach that? I'm a, I'm, I'm a part of this group, this lifelong learning, this gray audience that we're talking about. Yep. Um, what are you because seeing on the that? learning or the gray, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, both, both, both. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, trust me, I'm there. But it, um, yeah, no, we're seeing, I, it, we're very excited about, um, yeah, it was a really, I talked to uh, did a call with a company in India yesterday, actually, um, who is a, a line aligned with um, Manipal University, which is a very high brand university in India, which is actually philanthropically funded by a, by a, by a wealthy family. And they have separately funded this company, um, which is leveraging Manipal to deliver um, higher education, you know, high quality higher education to tier three, four and five cities in India, which, which are, you know, where, where communities where, where People never get access to higher education, um, and and they're having incredible traction. And the idea that a very I mean this would be like taking I don't know one of the Ivy Leagues and saying yeah we're we're delighted to um, we're delighted to have our brand extended into you know into a non you know quote non exclusive um, uh, market you know, which is I just think fantastic right. So if we can see more kind of movements like that where people are willing um, to, you know we'll do anything. To make sure there are people getting people who, who have not traditionally gotten access are going to get access at at, at low at, at low cost and affordable you know at, at affordable delivery. Um, so I think that we I think we're seeing a lot more you know a lot of activity like that actually Ryan I think I mean actually Guild I mean you mentioned Guild I mean Guild obviously is um, oh obviously if you if you know what Guild does but Guild Guild is is um, what what the, the revolution that Rachel Carlson um in her vision was that tuition reimbursement and tuition assistance plans have been around in the united states forever um they hadn't been very highly utilized and when they were highly utilized they were utilized by sort of c-suite or middle middle management um to get you know to get uh, uh college college or or um, graduate degree um uh, credentials and her revolution was you know why don't we take why don't we take these programs and actually have companies begin to think about them as as ways to 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 educate you know further skill you know upskill and reskill and side skill I mean there are all these kind of different strategies now which is fascinating they're frontline workers so they're workers who may need a high school um, equivalency degree they may need a they may need um, they may need a, a college credential they may need a certificate they may need you know to be able to move over from one job so they can then um, you know climb into a higher paying job. And you know, all around creating mobility within the corporation. So obviously, you know, in the case of Guild, Walmart was a early early adopter, embrace of the of the of, of the product. They now have a massive a billion dollar budget dedicated to to the upskilling, reskilling um, of of their frontline massive workforce. Um, so I think that it and it and I think it's it, it's been both you know great entrepreneurs like Rachel Carlson, but also. Um, great companies like Walmart, Chipotle, Walt Disney, um, you know, Target, Amazon, et cetera, who who have who have embraced 
um, Coke, I'm sure does it, uh, who have embraced the concept that, that you know, companies are now the fourth education system. There is, there is a responsibility and a benefit um, to, to, the, to both the employee and the employer um, to delivering, you know, to delivering um, the ongoing education to folks who, who, who may not have had a great experience in education previously and, um, and, and didn't think it was worth their investment. And so I just think we're at, at a moment of sea change in that regard. And, um, and it's, and one of the, and, and this whole talent short, the shortage coming out of, you know, the great resignation and the shortages coming out of um, the pandemic are going to make that even more exciting because companies are, you know, even if companies, even if companies had, had, sort of refused to budge on the, you know, degree requirement or what, you know, traditional uh, hiring requirements. Um, if they want to fill, if they want to fill their jobs, they probably are going to have to have a change of mind on that because, because the, you know, the, 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 the employees are just not available. Um, so I think it's a, it's an interesting silver lining of the pandemic, but, but yes, I think we are, we're, we're finally turning our attention globally to, to, to people who had not historically had the right access um, or incentives um, or engagement or voice um, to, 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 to tackle uh, that kind of learning and skilling. Wow. A lot there, Ryan. Keep going. Oh, so exciting. I, I, uh, I, I think this is, this is huge. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to jump. If Joel will allow me, I'm going to ask a, another one of those questions where I'm asking for a friend, but really it's, it's, for me. So as a philanthropy, love it. we've, we've, uh, you know, we've realized that philanthropy in some ways has been a part of the problem in the past where, where they've propped up the, um, yep. artificially. So kind of propped up the traditional system in ways that created the wrong kind of incentives to, you know, that thwarted innovation. So what advice do you have to a philanthropy or other investors that want to have, impact to drive real transformation what advice do you have for us moving forward yeah i it it is really interesting um and i think that uh that dynamic has has matured so much too i mean i remember when um when jim shelton was still at the gates foundation and um and the ed tech sector was not moving right I and mean, we were not seeing progress and it was really frustrating and the frictions were everywhere k-12 higher ed wherever workforce and um and 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 gates at the time was grappling with you know where's the fine line where if we become too much of a kingmaker that we actually we actually you know we actually subsume the 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 um the entrepreneur you know entrepreneurialism and the and the innovation and 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 or you know sub optimize the outcome as opposed to optimizing the outcome and i think the good news is in ed tech in education not just ed tech education today um the capital that's come in i mean is education has been an under invested category forever um, and education innovation has been an underinvested category, certainly when you look at other healthcare or any other category. Now that we've actually achieved pretty close to parity with healthcare in terms of um, investment dollars coming in, and, and healthcare is similar too, because healthcare has lots of philanthropic dollars and lots of um, commercial investment dollars. Um, I actually think that the robust um, the, the, the robust dollars coming in from, from commercial investors uh, is a very positive to creating that balance between what philanthropists can do to catalyze innovation versus what commercial investors can do. So I actually think that the, the, the dilemma that you guys have is, 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 is much easier today because the sector has, has come into its own. There's still, and you guys know this so much better than I do, there are still so many important places um, within the education spectrum that will not that that require the the seeding and the promotion of philanthropic dollars. I mean, because because they just they're just going to need to you know it's like a plant, right? I mean, they're gonna, they need to get watered. They need to and 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 maybe maybe not. They can 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 get to to a self sustaining place. But but there's still so but there are many many important um, 
you know, places, places that remain that, that really require and demand. Um, we were on a phone call today with ASA and, and the funding they're doing around career readiness. Um, in high schools uh, to try to get you know younger people thinking about career earlier because it's not taught in schools and there's no capacity to do that um, and um, so it's uh, it's um, um, I I just think I think Ryan I think that the debate there has gotten a lot um, I don't want to say easier but I think I think it it's it's very clear that we need both um, it, and it's and it again. What I love is how people pick their spots. I mean, you guys have so carefully picked your spots. You know, you see, and, and people move on their spots that they pick, right? Um, and and I think that's important too. I mean, if you know, the, you know, the Gates has is found that they you know, they did reading and math for a while. Well, that helped seed a bunch of companies that went out and cre created. There's a big movement into into virtual tutoring, um, and both philanthropic support of that as well as commercial support of it. And I think they're actually working together um, to support. Uh, the development of scaled or scaled delivery. Um, and so I think that's, I, I think it's, a, I actually think that was a dynamic that we worried about a decade ago. Um, the, the sort of, you know, no labels, are you for profit, not for profit, it shouldn't really matter. Um, I think the, I think the, um, I think the balance and the, and the, um, uh, whatever the, the I'm struggling for the word, but the complementarity of the role of, of great philanthropy and the role of great investing um, has gotten much more promising or much more exciting, um, I, I guess, if that's a if that makes sense to you. Right. Yeah, it makes makes total sense. That was that was really helpful and encouraging. Let me uh, shift just a tad, uh, Deb, if you don't mind, <clears throat> before I hand it back to you, Ryan, for any final questions and we close out the episode. But I want to know um, a little more about you because you've got like superpowers, like investment superpowers and superpowers to identify all these companies and, and all these infrastructure powers you have that I, I'm like soaking in all of it. But you didn't start in education or in ed tech, in ed tech and you started in, it looks like in finance. Uh, so how do you take this superhero's journey into what you do now? Oh, well, you're, thank you. Um, I'm certainly not a superhero, but, um, and send me all your secrets, please by email. I, I will. I will. The, um, yeah, you know, it was, yes, I was an investment banker. Um, uh, and I actually, um, part 25 years ago, I met, um, uh, Michael Moe, who was a, a head of growth research and strategy at Montgomery Securities. And I recruited him over to Merrill Lynch to be, um, my counterpart. I was a, a head of growth research, head of growth banking. He was head of growth research. And, and so, it was Michael, Michael had begun to write in the mid 1990s, a series of white papers about, you know, why education technology should be one of the most important emerging growth investing categories in, in um, the world. Uh, it took a little longer to get there than, than we might have liked, but um, for all the frictions that we just talked about, but I got, I got very inspired by that vision. I mean, we built, we built a couple of, a couple of businesses in between, but um, when we, we sold our a company called Think Equity Partners. I just really decided in 2008 that um, both because I'd become very philanthropically involved in KIPP schools and did a crazy two-year stint on the Chicago Public School Board and you know Teach for America and some other some other initiatives I had had gotten involved in my personal life um, that that I just wanted to hunker down and do 100 percent you know education innovation and education technology. Um, and because um, I was just so inspired by it, and I'd also had the benefit of you know, having you know, two amazing parents um, who have been who have been huge inspirations in in creating their own philanthropic initiatives uh, around education and actually linking it to housing. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and um, and mom and dad had 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 created some really important um, important vehicles in that community to um, take take students, kids from public housing and for Habitat Humanity Housing into, um, and carry them over into success, um, higher education success at the University of North Florida and, and, other, and other places. Um, and so that was also, you know, that was kind of something I lived and breathed um, growing up. And so that helped, I'm sure too, on my DNA. Um, but yeah, no, I was really lucky. And, 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 I, and I realized having been an investment banker that if I, you know, that, you know, a broad investment banker that when I started doing education, it was just, 
something that got me out of you know bed at, in the morning in a, in a different way than covering you know large consumer packaged goods companies or that, something like that. Not that that's not a wonderful job, but it just wasn't what inspired me. And um, and yeah, so we sort of took it from there and it and built an advisory practice and built the summit you know 13 starting 13 years ago and 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 then and then the fund and um so it's been a great evolution i you know it's one of those things where you know the older i've gotten um the further away i've gotten from retirement and the um more 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 passionate i've gotten about what i do professionally and that's yeah, uh let's not forget that's to a mention kind of that fun thing to happen you know let's not forget to mention you're a board member of every, every educational technology company in the united states at least uh it looks like <laughs> from, from your linkedin I'm, I'm looking at this going how in the world do you do it i mean honestly well it's, it's crazy it's also it's all, it's all synergistic it's synergistic that's the good news it's synergistic oh gosh all right ryan over to you oh the the, the you you mentioned the summit i i i am such a big fan of that that event and uh i'm just curious given all the momentum, some of it unpredicted. What do you see as the next big step for ASU GSV, the, the summit? Well, uh, you know, thank you for asking. Thank you for saying it. It's great. Uh, we do, it's a labor of love, that's for sure. Um, so we're taking our tack this year is a little different. We're, you know, our overarching theme is um, ed, ed on the edge. And, and we think that's got, you know, sort of a multi, you know, um, sort of a whole series of meanings. It, it, it resonates everything from Web3 and the metaverse and what's happening there with emerging technologies um, to, you know, society on the edge and, and the concept that, that, you know, that if we don't um, address educational inequality and, and other key issues like climate change that we, you know, that we're all gonna be facing much bigger problems and that, that education and the educational community is a, a really important um, solution uh, or, or a really important group to be um, tackling some of some of our largest problems. So, so we're really, we're, we're trying um, and, and, you know, we think we do think we, you know, we finally, the, the education innovation technology sector has sort of achieved full um, sort of size and legitimacy in time in turn, you know, relative to other um, technology categories for sure, but, but also in terms of the, the issues themselves finally perhaps finally achieving the, uh, the appropriate level of global attention um, from a policy and 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 every else perspective and certainly you know coke spends spends much time and resources on on that element of it and um and so we want to, so we want people to think very deeply about what what we can do as a group um to to really address you know some of the some of the you know the deeply serious things that we are that we're all facing so we think and and, and you know again so we like but we do like to run the gamut add on the edge everything from metaverse and and web3 and what you know artificial intelligence or gaming or ar and vr can do um over to uh you know what what do we as a, a group need to do to be thinking about related to education and climate change for example so um we're hoping to amp up the conversation in that way and it's just a little a little bit different um or a little bit of a not different so much as an evolution from where we've been um over the last couple of years so we're so we're really excited about um about april and um i think the crazy part is we're doing april to get back on our pre-covid um calendar um so that's where right, what our, 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 our hotel contracts are and uh we thought, oh my gosh, there won't be enough time for things to be interesting between August and April. And the crazy thing is, there's you know, there's so much has changed in this, in the space um, between August and today um, that we that we're almost overwhelmed by the number of things that we could talk about. So yeah, so it's it, it we're, we're excited. It's it's a it should be a great program, and um, you know, we'll, we're obviously nav all navigating our way through um, Omicron, but um, but uh, Anyway, we're we're optimistic on that front and um, really excited about uh, what what's coming down the pipe in April. So exciting! Now I got I got to say, Deb, you've got a really uh, strong influence on Joe. He's so much better behaved on this one than he was. When <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I am. Because <clears throat> I'm waiting for my friend to get the information about where to invest all his money. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just with you. But, but Dan, let me ask you, because we, we, um, we here at the EdUp Experience, we've had the, the honor of interviewing a, a bunch of ed tech companies, uh, emerging, uh, um, big ones, uh, for sure. And, and, you know, there's, um, there's so many 
that everybody's everybody would just go crazy, right? If you're a small ed tech company and you get an investment from GSV or, or or working with the Coke Foundation, I mean that's everybody's dream to be able to grow and scale their business. What advice do you give to these organizations starting out? They've got the idea, they've they've got the motivation. Is is it sometimes I wonder? Are, is there so many companies doing the same thing that it's hard to differentiate yourself now? I mean, what's that piece of advice that you would give to those out there looking to take that next large step in helping education? Yeah, I think you have to be really careful not to be doing, um, you know, not to be a me too, you know, a me too, an attempt me too. Uh, we certainly are seeing a lot of a lot of um, uh, competitive activity in certain spaces where there are a number of folks um, sort of taking slightly different tweaks of something somebody else has done. Um, so I, I think we're, you know, we're always looking for a, a clear, a clear differentiation, something that's really going to make a company special, different or great. Um, and so I think for an entrepreneur, I think it, it, it's really important to have um, one, you know, a, to really see a unique opportunity. And then two, you know, some of our best entrepreneurs are the ones that, that have, have gone, you know, in, in looking for product market fit, have, have, have real, you know, have realized they needed to do you know, tweak this or pivot this way or whatever, and, and perhaps take the original vision, but, but reform it in order to, to, to get real product market fit, which is really the first, you know, the first indication that you're on, you know, you're on the right track. And, um, you know, and I think it really is the most important first, you know, product market fit is really the most important first, first indicator of whether you're, whether you're, you know, um, using your time wisely or, or, or not. And, um, yeah, so I think it, and I think you do have to, you really watch out um, on the, um, you really do have to watch out on the, uh, um, on the Me Too stuff. Ryan, any final words? What are your final words today? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, this has been, it's been awesome, Deb. Um, just trying to think. Um, we're just honored to, to partner with you, I guess. What, I'm, what I continue to be concerned about is we've got all this momentum, all this change is occurring, all this investment, but a lot of the culture around education still still seems to need to change. Yep. Just, just around the way that we think and act about learning. And you know, so much of the time and focus is is spent on free college or other issues that I, I'm not discounting. They're, yeah. they're important, yep. but but they're not getting at the fundamental things that you've outlined in your vision. How do we, how do we continue to drive change culturally from a, like at a societal yeah. level? And I know that's a, a big question, but that's something we're wrestling with a lot. Love your input on that. Yeah. And I think that's, it's, you know, totally correct. And, and that's why, honestly, I think that's why it's so important that there's this mix of public private partnership and catalyzation. Um, I think, you can often see, I mean, if you look at what I mean, everybody always loves to say, the MOOCs, you know, oh, they, they didn't work. Well, they did work. They, they really worked because they forced universities to rethink the online delivery of education. And so, um, and, and, the, and the things that have, a, have, have spun out of, and Coursera, you know, Coursera is a poster child, um, it is, you know, so, so I think what's really important is that we continue to push these um, partnerships and um, that one can catalyze the other. Forward thinking foundations combined with great entrepreneurs um, can, and can really show results and really change the minds of people because, because the proof's in the pudding, right? So, so I think we need to keep showing that this works. Um, you know, there have been periods in ed tech where that, that things didn't work and, and, and now they can work and we can show examples of how they're working at scale. Wow. And you know, Ryan, it's funny that you said I was more well behaved because, <clears throat> and just so you guys know, not to gross you out, but I, you know, every time you guys are talking, I'm eating my sandwich because I have to like eat lunch at some point and I, and I can't eat and hit my sound effect buttons at the same time. And I, I know you guys need to know this piece of information about me, but I just found that out about myself. So, and Deb, everything you're saying is so important, I think right now, you know, is you're seeing things before the rest of us get to see it and, and, and the, um, trends that you're pointing out, the investments that uh, GSV has made, the, the wins, 
I mean, look how those companies have changed the entire face of education. And I think we're this audience will be fascinated by what you have to say. And I know that the, the ASU GSV Summit continues to grow every year. Um, and Ryan, I know that you're you're huge uh, in the Koch Foundation's huge at ASU GSV. It's just continuing to gain momentum, this, this um, uh, ed tech uh, piece of higher ed. And uh, I'm glad that you could bring those insights. And I'm going to ask you the final question of this episode, which is, and we're going to quote you and put your answer all over social media. I know we won't okay, perfect. That, but what is the perfect. future of higher education as you see it? Oh, I think the future of higher education is that it gets defined much more broadly, right? That higher higher becomes defines everything you learn after you graduate from high school. And so I think I think it gets you know whether it's you know stackable credits. I had a great conversation about this um, yesterday um, with with you know some of the great forward thinking universities are thinking about how they capture greater lifetime value from their students and not just the four-year experience but they'll be there when they come back to do you know credentialing for technical job or they come back when they do so we need to think about it much more expansively that 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 higher educate higher education means everything that happens from you know 12th grade till gray 12th you know sort of 13 to gray i guess and um and, and, and that we get much more fluid about what we think that, that higher education means. I and mean, people get so hung up on higher, and the funny part about the whole you know, college piece and back to the free college and everything else is that you know, the reality is 25% of the world's population has a college degree. So we're sort of not talking about 75% of the people if we're talking about traditional higher education. And that's, you know, that in and of itself is a problem. So I think it, I think it, 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 it is the, the embrace of a more, much more expansive definition of what higher education means and, and how, it's imp, you know, how important it is to, again, giving all people equal access to the future that not just 25% or 35%, but 100%. And so, you know, that's my hope. I think we're seeing a lot of, you know, employers change their attitudes about having only hiring college graduates and being much more flexible about certificate acceptance and and, and things like that. And I think that has to keep to, you know, evolving for us to, you know, be that sort of the, in my mind, the, the higher ed utopia. Mm. Well, you blew, uh, blew my mind today, Deb, with everything that you said. I, I really appreciate you uh, coming on. Thank Ryan, you. Uh, how'd you feel about everything? Uh, incredible. I'm, I'm with you. I, this has been a, an incredible conversation. Thanks so much, Deb. For all all right, you. guys. Thank you so much. We really, I really appreciate your having me. It was awesome. Well, Deb, I got to give it. Wait, wait. I got to give you the outro. But first, before I do, I gotta, I gotta give Ryan his out, outro today. My first time guest co-host. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. He's executive director of the Charles Koch Foundation. Ryan Stowers. Ryan, thanks for coming on that up today. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. And of course, another, yet another standing ovation. Here it is. <laughs> My guest today, Deb Rapazzo, she's managing partner at GSV Ventures and co-founder at ASU GSV. Deb, an honor, and I mean an honor to have you here on the EdUp Experience today. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you just add up. Employers use Unmodel to source talent directly from community colleges with a click of a button to commission needed training to develop existing talent. Highly qualified and diverse talent is absolutely necessary to grow in today's workforce. Try your free subscription today at unmuddle.com slash employers.